Okay, folks, can we wrap up and we'll get, we've got quorum. I know people will be wandering in, but we've got a lot to do tonight. So, um, Patrick Johnson, are you online? Yes, I am. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to, I know, right? Awesome. Yeah, sorry I'm not there. My dad, I'm taking him up to the VA and he's 84 and I just, I'm risk averse right now. So I'm very sorry. Yeah, we're glad to hear you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. In any second now, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Is Greg online? Okay. We've got a quorum, so we're going to go ahead and get going because there's a lot to get through tonight. But I, I suspect people will wander in and then we'll backtrack. And okay. So one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Patrick, We're good. nine, Greg. Excellent. And so now that we know who's here, I can do rope call. So let me formally call this meeting to order at 6.05 and beg your assistance tonight on meeting etiquette because Sue is not here to keep us on the straight and narrow. So, um, and boy, do I miss her. So we'll do roll call first. Mr. McBride. Yes. Ms. Yarnell Holleman. Uh, Julia is absent, excused. Mr. Rogers. Ms. Bacon. Mr. Finley, no, Ms. Finley. <laughs> Here. Mr. Johnson. I am here. Absolutely. Uh, Kate Menninger may be joining us online, not here yet. Greg Manahan. I'm off mute, Greg. I am here. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Molly Olson here. Mathai. Apologies. Um, Mathai. Sorry, I only have last names. I think so, yeah. Um, Sitton, Brad? Nope. And our student rep. Ah, could you introduce yourself real quick so people know your name? Thank you. Awesome, I made it through the roll call, but okay. And we'll probably pick up more as we go. Okay, so the first agenda item is old business, of which there is none. Second agenda item is the consent calendar. Um, I would like a motion to accept the minutes of the December 15th meeting. All in favor? Uh, aye. And Greg and Patrick, we need you guys to, to sing out so that we know you're with us. I am uh, abstaining because I wasn't at the last meeting, so. Oh, <laughs> okay. And Greg? Yes, I'm good. Awesome. All right, thank you. It's unanimous. Sorry, guys. It's a little, a split meeting is always a little trickier. Okay, on, the, on to new... Oh, sorry, public comments. Do we have any public members here or on Zoom to comment tonight? Please speak up if you do. Okay, Whew. moving on. New business. Um, in addition to starting through the um, projects, I had a uh, asked Will to take us through, we've been, we're a third of the way through, and asked Will if he would take us through how the process is working. Um, 
So Will, let me hand it over to you. It seems like only moments since we were here again last night, doesn't it? So we're going to actually do this in three parts and the three staff present are going to present each of these parts. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a quick overview of what we've already done so far with the funds that were already allocated. And Katie's going to be taking this, but you're going to see that you have a handout on your table and the handout shows you a chart and some statistical information about the projects from ARPA 1. Katie, over to you. Perfect. So I have it up on the screen too, but we just wanted to give a brief overview of what we've been working on. So as of right now, we have issued the essential worker stimulus bonus, which came in um, roughly 30000 under budget. So that was kind of nice. And we have also issued the Berg Bucks, their full allotment. We got the MOU back from them, signed and ready to go. We are still working with YCAP to get the MOU signed so that we can release their funds. Um, we are still working with legal to figure out the SDC reduction for the Fairfield Inn. And the financial software, we have signed a contract and we have our first payment that's encumbered, but we have yet to disperse the check as of right now. And then the city staff computer upgrade is also, we have done the, the competitive bid process for that. And we have selected a vendor and we are in the process of going through that. So we have encumbered funds for that, but not yet written the check. And I know that IT is in the process of doing the competitive bids also for the security enhancement plan, but we just haven't gotten quite as far with that just yet. And then the blue zones also have been encumbered. So we have made those purchases and we have some even here, as you can see. So that check is on its way out. So yeah, we're moving right along with everything. Thank you. Just a quick comment. It's a lot of work to do the payroll right now. So getting that money out was a lot of extra effort. Well done. And now over to Shannon. Good evening, Shannon Buckmaster, Economic Health Manager with the City of Newburgh. I was, um, I'm pleased actually to, to present a brief overview of what the application is looking like you'll notice that for fund two and certainly for fund three moving forward we have several more small business and nonprofit applications for arpa funding uh, we did release a business friendly application it was a shorter version than the original application with clear directions that applications would be considered based on the order that they were received that we would be placing 12 applications on each agenda with approval for up to eight of those. The instructions were for a completed application based on a very simple question process to be submitted to Will Worthy. Many of our businesses also copied myself and oftentimes Katie Strode, our finance director, in those emails as two, emails too. Uh, when we received an application, we used the timestamp from the email to prioritize, prioritize the application, but then we also made sure we did a preliminary review to make sure the projects that you are reviewing are feasible or possible. We certainly didn't want to bring a project to you, especially if it was a physical expansion or a construction project that uh, was not possible to complete based on codes, ordinances, easements, whatever those conversations were. I do want to acknowledge the uh, planning department and engineering department, specifically Doug Rux and Karen Hoffman for their extra work reviewing these applications um, to make sure that they, they were feasible. Um, after we established that the project would be able to meet all of the ARPA guidelines and could also be completed, the application was placed on the agenda. We have built a list that does go into our next meeting plan for March 30th. We have a wait list for that process. At this point, we have a lot of interest. You'll see that we have very diverse projects. I also want to recognize or acknowledge Ezekiel Garcia, who has helped with translation services. We did have 
we have had two applications that have come through our process where the uh, business owner was primarily uh, Spanish speaking. And so we did work together for translation support on those applications as well. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. It's like musical chairs. Okay, <laughs> so here's the third part of this triumvirate. I wanted to give you a quick update on what the third round of ARPA will have in store for the March 30 session. At this time, we have another 18 projects in the queue for the third round. And depending on the results of tonight's voting, we may or may not have the funding to do many of these projects. No matter what tonight's results are, I anticipate that the third round of ARPA will be the last round strictly for financial reasons. The third round projects are varied between nonprofits and for-profit organizations. This evening, staff would most kindly like two things from the budget committee in addition to your project choices. We, the staff, need to understand how the process will end when the remaining fund balances become low in the third round. And staff and Molly have worked on a possible solution. Naturally, you may have other ideas for how we could do that process and we can discuss them tonight. The second thing the staff would like is to cap further apl ARPA applications because there's an increasing likelihood that any further ones that are received might not be funded anyway because of the diminishing fund balance. Staff have worked with the budget chair to create this possible method to wrap up the process, but as I say, you may have other suggestions that you would like to discuss. And that's a quick summary on how the future looks. Any questions? Um, actually, <clears throat> We have people waiting. So if we did, a, uh, let's try discussing it now. And if we, you know, if we can't wrap it up in like five, 10 minutes, then we'll do it at the end and let these people go. That's okay. Yeah. I'm good. Just, sorry, sorry. So suggest, uh, do, we have a de do we have a deadline published? No. Oh, you want me to come up? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so on that, my, my first suggestion or, or, or thought would be to publish a date certain that that's, that's the cutoff date, right? And that's well known by everybody. Um, and then we can get that. Secondly, on having a, you know, so we may have 18, may have 25 applications. I would actually suggest a fourth meeting uh, for two reasons. One, to make sure we can go through all of the, all of the applications, right? And then also to have sort of a post-mortem on how this went. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just think it might be good for us to, to review it. So that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Oh, the other thing is, um, if if we, are we gonna know tonight the applications that may not have made the cut because of planning or, or something else? Will they be in the queue tonight too, or? There are no applications at this time which have not made the Okay, great, Everything thanks. Thank you, appreciate it. I did get one clarification. Um, applications that had an issue, for example, someone wanted to build seating on someone else's property and they didn't have agreement from that other party. So the planning department pointed out that they really should resubmit and they went back and fixed it. So most of the um, no, you're not in the queue yet has been because you won't get voted for, fix it so that they have a chance to say yes. Okay, so is there um, any other thoughts on the process? Rick had set a date. I'm gonna try and consciously remember Patrick and Greg because when you're online, you tend to be forgotten. So Patrick or Greg, any comments? And you guys help me remember to do that. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good, I'm just listening. Okay. So would, um, 
the proposal that we had was that um, essentially we would establish a date by which we would say, hey, we're not taking anymore. Uh, and we'd like that date to be like tomorrow or the day after or something reasonable that says, guys, we're, the hopper is too full. We don't have enough money. We know that. Um, the second thing is, here's, here's the dilemma. Next meeting, we go through, we vote, and we get the top winners, and we get a bunch of ties. And then the money left is less than the, some of the next ones. So the thought was, all right, we still have money left, but we can't fund some of these because they're asking for more than we have. So then we redo the list with everyone asking for as much as we have or less. In other words, things we could actually fully fund. So if we have 100,000 left and a project on the list is asking for 200,000, we're gonna take them off the list because we can't fully fund them. And, but we don't wanna leave that 100,000 to go to waste. So we would, we would have you vote on the ones that we could fund. So it's just, that was a suggestion. The, the issue is once we get through the first round of voting, there will be some money left and there will be projects asking for more than that sum. What do we do with them? And my suggestion was you can't fund them, so let's take them off the list, but that's just a suggestion. Elise, you need to grab the mic, sorry. Oh, careful. So I've been having an issue just myself with um, not the process, the process, you, you, everyone has done a fabulous job with how, with, with this organizational structure. My concern is that the first round we didn't know what was going to be in the third round. And so it's a little awkward because I have this gut feeling that there are projects today that won't get funded that I probably would have voted for over projects that were in the first round. And so I would love if whatever pot of money is left at the end, we stacked up all the ones that were not funded between the three rounds. And we did a poll of the top project we wanted to give the rest of the money to. So in the case that, you know, police um, body cameras, it could go towards funding it. I would be more, I would be more happy with that than fully funding a project. So Rick? Yeah. The, uh, the, the only other thing I'd say is that, you know, partial funding is, is very common among, uh, for grant recipients. So I wouldn't think that that would be too much of a problem. I would almost do it. I, I, I certainly understand what Elise said and that, that, that does make this awkward. But I think by the time we get to the end, if we're funding eight, the ninth, and we have 100,000 left and they want 200, I'd give them 100 and say they're the ninth place is what I would, what I would do, but that's my suggestion. So there, there is a risk with this. Um, and we can do it, by the way. We are in charge of what we decide to do. Um, when we allocate the money to someone, we do it based on the MOU and what they've asked for and what they're going to provide. We then have to provide documentation that they did what they said they would do with the money that we gave them. If what they said they were going to do takes 200,000 to do and we give them 100,000 and they can't deliver on what they said, the city has to pay the federal government back the 100,000. So my, my only thing is I don't, I want, you can't eliminate risk. There is always risk, but I would like to keep the risk to a reasonable. So if people could rewrite their request, so that it was for the partial fund, and that could be the fourth meeting, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm a little worried about handing someone a lot of money and then having to take it out of the general fund when they, they can't deliver. That's my only concern. So Elise or here. Okay. So if that, if that works, we'll work on that. Take your input and email you a process that we will try and encompass it all, because we want to give it all away. Um, the last thing was, if we end up with $35 in there, we were going to put it in the water fund, because it is absolutely ARPA okay to partially fund water projects, because you've got a zillion of them and stuff. So that was the last thing for whatever leftover that we couldn't get rid of. Is that... Oh, wait, go ahead. Did I say it wrong? Yes, <laughs> Will knows the right words. I was just going to say, just for clarity, if you could state the process roughly that we're going to kind of kick the idea around, and so we know what we're, so we know what our homework is. I will try. Did you have a question, Mike or Rick? 
or comment that. So, so we'll have that option when we're done. And maybe, maybe the smart thing is we say, look, when we're done, we'll figure out how much is done and we'll, we'll, we'll roll through that then. Um, so the one question I, I need your comments on is next meeting, there are 18 and they vary in size, just like this meeting from, you know, five digits to half a million or whatever. Um, if we give away money in the first round and there's somebody who wants a lot and we don't have a lot, are you okay with us then moving the voting to people we can fund and, and taking the big project out of the running? Because I, I, Or do you wanna do partial funding and take the risk to the city? That's my question. No, they'll all be on the list. They'll all be on the list. But once we don't have enough money after the first vote, then, so at this point I'm hearing, am I hearing anyone who wants to do partial funding? I'm hearing that in the room, there's a lot of head shaking. I don't want to do it. I just want to make sure. Okay. So. Right, it would, exactly. I think Greg has a question. Greg? Uh, yeah, the only thing that I would weigh in at, on is on partial funding is that some projects can be funded partially and others can. So, you know, if if it's, you know, how many meals you're going to serve or how many students you're going to serve could be scaled up or down based on uh, the, the project size, then then I would, you know, so partial funding is very contingent on the type of project being funded. Exactly. Okay, then um, staff will work on a process. I will work with you, take all this input. It's not different from what we were saying, except for at the very end, how do we handle the, the I'm, I'm confident we can come up with something that will be okay. Yeah, no, I think that'd be good. All right, we have people. Yeah. Can I, make one comment? I just wanted to make one comment on the potential fourth meeting. Um, after the April or the March 30th meeting, two weeks later, we start the regular budget process. So I'm, the city is willing to do whatever the committee wants. I just wanted to put that out there that we start the regular budget meetings two weeks later. Right. So with that in mind, I'll make a quick announcement. I didn't want to send out the kickoff for the budget committee <laughs> before tonight because I was terribly afraid people would think we were talking about tonight. So there's a proposed process, a training schedule, all of that coming your way in an email this week. I just didn't want to do it before tonight, but it's coming up. It's in April. Can you believe it? Okay. With that, if we're good, um, I think we can go to our first one. I don't know who's our runner tonight. Are you running, Will, or Shannon? Yeah. Shannon, we need, actually, they're online. Our first one is actually... Uh, project E on your list is swapping places with project A because of scheduling difficulties. Of the agenda? Okay. Okay, and who's presenting for the small business marketing assistance? So Polly, Scott, and Leslie all, are all presenting, and I will start, and then we'll, we're, we're going through a script. So I'll just, I'll, I guess I'll just start. Newburgh small businesses need a robust online presence to drive businesses to their brick and mortar stores. Newburgh needs more than businesses simply to thrive online. We need their online success to build the physical community where we work and live and where tourists want to visit. Um, we all know the effects of COVID pandemic have proved to be varied and lasting. 
when first faced with closures and restrictions, uh, small businesses and supporting organizations saw devastating impacts on their revenue stream. Um, in 2021, supply chain interruptions, labor force shortage have all hindered their recovery efforts. And we don't know what 2022 is going to bring, but we do know one of the most important ways our local small businesses will be able to overcome the next economic hurdle will be through robust online marketing programs and that. According to Morgan Stanley, 91% of adults have their mobile phone within arm's reach 24-7, an 80% increase in sales for companies that adopt a mobile-centric approach. Newberg's small businesses are in survival mode and have little time to devote to enhancing their digital marketing. This is why we are proposing a suite of robust and integrated small business marketing assistance tools provided and administered by the Chehalem Valley Chamber of Commerce, Case Newberg, and the Newberg Downtown Coalition. The suite of mobile-centric business solutions will amplify the economic recovery and future growth of small businesses. A suite of mobile-centric business marketing solutions delivered by the collaborative efforts of the CVCC, Case Newberg, and the NDC will work together to create a robust online marketing resource for the future growth of small businesses, as well as an enhanced visitor itinerary planning tool. This includes an app called Point and Save, which is a mobile app for the business and visitors of Newburgh. With one swipe, people can link to a business website, call them, get directions, or purchase tickets to a local event. There are also pages with an event calendar, as well as community resources. Visit Widget is a next generation planning tool designed to enhance visitors' experiences, capture demographic data, and drive more visits. Both Point and Save and Visit Widget rely on accurate Google business listings. Therefore, the Downtown Coalition will host a series of Google My Business workshops hosted by the Downtown Coalition with the help of Taste Newberg and Travel Oregon's partnership with Local, the Chamber, as well as George Fox University. So what's included in the cost is a setup cost of $8,000, administration costs of $9,000, Monthly fees for 24 months at $598 per month. And I want you to note that if you did the math, you'll notice that 7,176 is not um, uh, 598 times uh, 24. It was 598 times 12. I did the math because I did the final um, writing of this. And so actually... Um, the ask for 24 months is what we, we had planned would be actually $14,352. Um, also, Travel, um, Travel Oregon's OTIS, which is Oregon Tourist Information System Integration, would cost estimated of $5,000. So the final ask, if to cover my mistake, would be $36,352. The implementation timeline would be um, two to six months to get this running, all of the apps running and going, and then 24 months of sustained funding from time of setup. And that's our presentation. Any questions? Questions? Nope, you're good. Thank you. And just to verify, um, Polly, it was 36,352. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay, number two is the Cultural Center Performing Arts Wing. There he is. Welcome. Go for it, Sean. All right. Well, um, I, I can talk all day. So in the interest of your time, I wrote some things down to try and keep it moving for you. You have five minutes, so you don't get to talk all day. Okay. We can start now? <laughs> yep. Well, good evening, Mayor Rogers, Councilors, Chair Olson, and members of the committee. 
I'm Sean Andrews, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Shehalem Cultural Center in support of our request of American Rescue Plan Act funding toward our community performing arts wing project. A stated goal of the American Rescue Plan Act is to respond to the public health emergency or its negative economic impacts, including assistance to nonprofits or aid to impacted industries such as tourism, travel, and hospitality. This proposal does just that by supporting a nonprofit as it develops a valuable resource for local tourism, travel, and hospitality interests negatively impacted by this public health emergency. Since its inception, the Shehalem Cultural Center has been committed to transformation through the arts with a mission to inspire and enrich lives by connecting community and culture. In its 11 years of operation, the CCC story has been one of steady and profound growth becoming the largest provider of arts and culture programming in Yamhill County and welcoming more than 85,000 guests each year. The Shehalem Cultural Center requests $250,000 in American Rescue Plan Act funding from the city of Newburgh to support 9,000 square feet of new capital construction, renovating currently unoccupied yet existing space. This community performing arts wing will include 250 seat LaJoy Theater, a dance and movement studio, a newly renovated Tri Family Grand Lobby, and more in our historic home inside the old Central School building. Yamhill County lacks a professional, mid-sized public use performance venue. Our project fills this need by providing access to high quality performing arts facilities for thousands of visitors and local residents while presenting an economic boon to Newburgh and the entire region. An independent economic analysis conducted by Eco Northwest in 2020 confirms this $5.3 million project will support 31 construction jobs. Spending by construction businesses and worker households will in turn contribute secondary impacts equivalent to 17 jobs and $2.1 million in local spending during the project's construction phase. In addition to these significant near-term impacts, this project will create a lasting and sustained impact on the economic future of Newburgh. According to the most recent Yamhill County Arts and Economic Prosperity Study, the average event attendee spends $31.22 on their way to and from the theater. This $31.22 per attendee is above and beyond any ticket price paid to the performance venue itself. By providing an anchor attraction, the Shehalem Cultural Center's performing arts wing will increase traffic to local restaurants, shops, businesses, creating and sustaining the equivalent of 17 full-time jobs and resulting in more than $2 million in annual economic activity. This project has broad community support. Taste Newberg supports this project stating, the Shehalem Cultural Center is an important element for two of Taste Newberg's strategic imperatives of promoting our region's cultural assets and marketing Newburgh as a four seasons destination. And this project should result in increased shoulder season visitation volume. The Shehalem Valley Chamber of Commerce adds, any improvement or investment in the cultural center becomes a measurable investment in our community. And Newburgh Downtown Coalition Executive Director Polly Peterson offers, when people come to the theater, they go to dinner beforehand, out for drinks afterward, and stop in at the local shops they pass along the way. More foot traffic in the downtown means more opportunities for people to spend money in Newburgh, bringing vitality to our downtown core. To summarize, this project will provide access to high quality performing arts facilities for thousands of visitors and local residents alike. This project will generate $7 million in construction-related economic activity in Newburgh over the course of the next year. This project will create and sustain an equivalent of 17 full-time jobs with an annual economic impact of over $2 million. This project will develop a regional attraction, raising Newburgh's desirability as a tourist destination. This project is shovel-ready. Construction of the Community Performing Arts Wing is set to begin later this year and to conclude in 2023. If funds are awarded from the city of Newburgh, this project will have a dramatic, positive, clear economic impacts on the future 
in, in the near future and for many years to come. I thank you for your time Sp and your considerations, and I'm minutes. happy to answer any questions. Questions? I do not want to waste your time. Questions uh, from Patrick or Greg? None here. Okay. None here as well. How long would it? Oh, okay. How long would it take for the projects to be complete? We believe it'll be done in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, there's many things to weigh when construction projects are underway, mm -hmm. but we do believe that construction should take less than 12 months and that we should be underway by the end of this calendar year. Okay. So this is more for the chair and for Katie. So when we're talking about timelines, we talked about before, and people have to show their work essentially. What happens if a project like this, they're gonna be done in 2023, but oops, something happened and it doesn't get completed. Where does that put us? And how much do they work do they have to show? Cause I'm assuming that this 250,000 isn't the entirety of the cost for the, so would they be able to say, here's your $250,000 worth of work, even though we're not completed? Yeah, and Will may even want to speak on some of this, but we're working on getting MOUs specific to each project that gets funded, knowing that some there's restrictions and construction costs and different things can come up. So I think that our responsibility when we disperse the funds is that they have to be making progress and it needs to be completed, I believe by 2024 mm -hmm. is the timeline. So that's when we vetted the projects that they needed to be feasibly completed by 2024, basically. Right. So it sounds like this project is reasonably going to be completed in 2023, so. Okay. Yeah. I guess my question is, what if it's not? <laughs> I'm not saying, I, I, and I am asking this question as a blanket question over all of these projects, um, especially construction projects, because they're not they're not their own timeline. They depend on other folks' timelines. So it's a little bit different than some of the other projects we've seen. So I guess my question is not specific to this project necessarily, but because it came to my mind during this project is what happens if it's not completed by then? Can we, if it's not a fully funded out of the ARPA funds, can they show their work, what they've done up until that point and that so it seems we like get, a very sensible, very sensible thing to do in the MOU is okay. to orient the ARPA fund MOU towards the earlier work. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's kind of what we're trying okay. to Thank do. You. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Yes. Rick. So, uh, Sean, this is you know this is going to be a quite, one of the things we're wrestling with, or that we've got a sort of question of partial funding um, for these things. Um, so, obviously, you have other sources. If you were to be partially funded, what we, would that be a difficult, would that be a challenge for you? Um, if we were partially funded, that could potentially slow down our timeline. We might have to do more fundraising. Um, it would not end the project for us, but we may have to recalculate our timelines based on that. Good question. Any other questions? Can't wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Thank you all for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, our next is um, sculpt sculpture landing pads. I believe Terry Esch is presenting. I saw her out there anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. You have to push the button. Oh, nope. Just push it. Hey, okay. Hey. Uh, Terry Ash, go ahead. Okay. 
Um, for those that don't know me, I'm, you can't recognize me. I'm Terry Emery, and I'm representing Emery. the Newburgh Downtown Coalition and uh, the Public Art Committee, Beautification Committee. Um, and so I know you've all read the proposals, so I don't need to go into too much detail, but I just wanted to reiterate what I'm asking for, which is up there. $15,000 um, for five sculpture landing parks. So they'd just be big concrete squares that we would put in good places throughout um, downtown. And that would allow us to be able to rent or purchase sculptures that would fit on them. So what our, our hope is, is to fill Newburgh with beautiful art. And what that does for us obviously is it's tourism because people come here to eat, drink and art. And it would definitely add to that. And we are still one of the communities that still doesn't have that. Um, and it really helps businesses, right? Because of the more people that would come for tourism, it's always better for the businesses and go downtown. Other part is I think for the general public because art is kind of a healing thing and we all can use it after COVID and other things. And I think it would help, really helps bring the community together. So it would be a wonderful investment and we aren't um, reinventing anything. So it's very simple. Um, it's Pads are simple and our sculpture program is simple. There's many, many towns that have a really good, good program set up. So we are not reinventing anything. We're just gonna use their program and use it for here. And you'll see over the next 18 months, hopefully at least five sculptures. One is ready to go. So there we go. Questions and answers. Sorry, I'm Terry Usher, someone I worked with years ago. I answer to anything. <laughs> you could have called me my dog. So. <laughs> I will not do that, I promise. Okay, questions? Anybody got any? So I think we do have uh, one sculpture already donated. Um, Correct. That just needs the landing pad. So, yeah. yeah. So, awesome. and that's just, you know, we have very powerful people on our committee. And we figure that once we start, it's going to be very good. Um, one of the things is, I don't, you guys know that the Allison has a really great sculpture exhibit up there and they've been so successful because they've sold quite a few. And that kind of gives us um, a great way to get good sculptures because we always have already have a reputation for selling them. So that would really help. So hopefully you're all as enthusiastic as me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Our next, I believe, is uh, family place expansion. Only this looks like Russ. Yes. TV station. TV station. That's right. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Russ is now doing family planning. That's yeah. Excellent. No. <laughs> <laughs> you behave. <laughs> and. Uh, Greg and Patrick, there are handouts in the room. So, along with the I pizza. I have handouts, and unfortunately, I didn't. I, I don't know there were others coming in. I would have had them so you could put them up on the That's okay, we'll share. I got Thank you. You got it. I got okay. plenty. That's right. This is this one now? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is item one on your agenda list. So good evening to everyone. My name is Russ Thomas. I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Newburgh. Uh, I'm here uh, to request a $100,000 uh, $100, to uh, install electric vehicle charging stations uh, in the downtown city core. Uh, what I handed out previously is a map of the charging stations that are currently within the, the City of Newburgh. And if you take a look at the map, just so you can, you got something to reference on it, the nearest one is actually uh, located at the Goodwill store, the downtown. 
The rest of them are out towards uh, Fred Meyer. There's only one level three charger that's at the Chevron station, uh, which works intermittently. Uh, one of the issues they have with level threes is, is keeping them running. Uh, but I want to give you that so you have a reference to what we have currently have down in the downtown core area. Uh, the purpose for this is to help promote tourism in our downtown. If you take a look at the uh, second page that is handed out, it's got the uh, current number of electric vehicles that are registered in the state of Oregon. And you can see uh, the highest numbers and in in the bottom has the high number amounts is Multnomah, Washington and Clackamas County and some in Lane County. If uh, an individual has an electric vehicle and wants to come and visit Newburgh and they need to charge, they're gonna be parked at Fred Meyer or, or Newburgh Ford or the Chevy dealership, um, Goodwill and have to walk downtown. And to help promote our downtown businesses with that, uh, having electric vehicle charging stations in our downtown core. The idea is that we would have a couple of charging stations in our second street public parking lot, provide one at the library, and then take a look at a, a remaining funds for uh, another location in the downtown core area, uh, probably near City Hall. The, the reason for the request, a charging station costs probably for a commercial size is between six and $8,000 just for the just for the charging station on a commercial uh, application. The infrastructure to get the wiring in, the electricity in to power it is what costs. Uh, working with PGE, they do have some uh, grants and would provide assistance in design engineering to get the electricity there, but we would have to pay for the infrastructure, the conduit, the wiring, uh, to get it there uh, with that. One of the uh, things that I did in doing some research on this was I actually contacted a brand new electric vehicle owner and asked them, what are your experiences, uh, Ben, when, when you're going out and visiting someplace as a tourist? Uh, and the response I got back was as a new EV, and I'm just going to read directly what was written. As a new EV owner, I've noticed a trend. Large box stores like Fred Meyer and Walmart are installing charging stations while other areas that have locally owned shops have no charging stations. This past week, I was on vacation near the Dalles and sure enough, once again, I found myself with charging at either Fred Meyer or Walmart. Funny enough, Newburgh has the same problem. If a tourist is visiting Newburgh with an electric vehicle, instead of visiting our local shops and restaurants, they will either be sitting at Fred Meyer or Walgreens for the 30 to 60 minutes it takes to charge their vehicle. Using some of the ARPA money to install a charging station closer to the downtown will give those businesses a bit of an ex, uh, extra foot traffic and promote using local businesses. And this is for somebody that has just bought one within the last six months in, in their experience. And I know that people that have uh, long-term EV owners have similar experiences, if not more so. There is a, an app out, PlugShare. Anybody who has a, an electric vehicle uh, knows about PlugShare and you can find it and what's available and what's, what's in use and what's not in use. Charging rates, uh, that type of thing. Also in talking with PG, they have uh, approved three different models uh, for their systems for charging. Uh, charge point, EV Connect, and Semi Connect. And, and these are uh, a plug and play unit which has expandability. As, as you may not be aware, most EVs have one of three plugs, but there's odd ones out there as well. And they're talking about doing a universal change to that to make them work. These units have the ability to make that change. And there's what is what I've been looking at. So for, to help promote the, the city of Newburgh, tourism in the downtown and provide the opportunity for those folks with electric vehicles to visit downtown Newburgh and not be at Fred Meyer and uh, at the Ford garage or at uh, Berg Chevrolet, nothing against them, but to give an opportunity for them to spend that hour in our, in our local shops, visiting our local vendors, in our restaurants, um, it's, would provide a potential additional uh, revenue for those businesses and promote the tourism within our town at this point. Um, so that is the extent of my request. Uh, again, uh, the majority of the owners, EVs probably 
close to 16,000 of them are from the metro area. And anybody that's been in any of our shops, wineries or anything knows that the vast majority of those folks come from the metro area uh, to visit out here. It's also the wave of the future. We are progressing slowly towards electric vehicles. Uh, the cost to operate them is less maintenance wise. It's less to charge them versus fuel. And with the ever rising prices of fuel, uh, I would see that trend continuing. Uh, so my request is for $100,000 to fund the infrastructure and charging stations to help promote tourism within the downtown Newburgh Court. Uh, long term, there would be additional maintenance costs, uh, obviously, to maintain that and uh, taking a look at the potential uh, revenue from that, the revenue would support the maintenance costs of, of these uh, charging stations. If we, if it so choose to approve it and if it so choose to charge for it. Questions? Questions. You kind of touched on this at the end. So I own an EV and when I go to charge mine, I pay to have it charged. It's not much, but it's a little bit. Do we get any of that revenue? And if we do, how much? It, it would depend on the uh, agreement that we work out with the company. We can go from uh, receiving the majority of it and paying strictly for the electricity uh, through it's, it's running about six to seven cents per kilovolt and, you, and they're charging 39 cents Yeah, uh, to charge 39 to 49. And they have in, in customers and outside customers that, that have that, but it would be a potential for revenue generation depending on uh, promotion and how well they're used. Other questions? Greg and Patrick, I don't mean to pick on you, but I want to make sure we're including you. No questions here, Greg. Awesome. And I'm good as well. Okay. I had one question that's come up and I think we should ask everyone who presents today. If we get into a situation where we need to do partial funding, could you do half the project with half the funding? Or could you, how would it impact? It, it could be scaled back. Again, it's uh, infrastructure improvements is the big cost. Uh, the second street parking lot does have power close by, uh, minimal cost, restoration cost. So it could be scaled back. That would preclude having another one at the library possibly, or having another one located at, at near city hall on, on city property. The potential is it could be scaled back, uh, with that. Okay. Thank you. I, I did have a, a question. I'm sorry. I just... I'm glad you head. do. I'm sorry. Uh, the um, the list that I see um, are those all publicly owned properties, so you wouldn't have to negotiate with property owners. This would all be on current public property. Is that correct? That's correct. the The property at the library is owned by the city of Newburgh. The Second Street parking lot is owned by the city of Newburgh. One other location, whether it would be uh, near public safety uh, or city hall, would also be on city owned property. And then a follow up, if I might, um, are those are, are there any permitting issues that 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 happen when you put these in or is that something that's fairly straightforward? It, it's pretty straightforward. And in talking with PGE and their engineers, they would uh, do all of the design work for us and ensure that they have the adequate and proper power supply to provide the energy for them. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Russ. Thank you for your time. Um, quick question. Kate, were you able to join us on the bridge? Not yet, okay. I just wanted to check, we gave her a Zoom link. Do people need a break? We've been, Anna, you doing okay? Okay, we'll keep going then if you're, Someone starts jittering in their chair, let me know. <laughs> All right. Then our next, <laughs> now we are into the Lutheran Community Services, I think. Yes. 
Who's presenting? Got uh, Joy Bailey, our community engagement manager, and Jordan Robinson, myself. So Joy is going to lead us off. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Good evening, budget committee members. Um, as Jordan said, uh, we'll be presenting on behalf of the Family Place Relief Nursery tonight. First off, I just wanted to thank you for having us here tonight, um, for working so hard to create a process for something that's, well, it's really new to all of us and for guiding organizations like a family place through it uh, in service of our community's most urgent needs. The proposal that we've brought before you may not look like much on its surface, but for anyone familiar with the work of a family place, uh, you know its success will transplate, translate into a surplus of billions of dollars every year just in our community. Now, if we maintain our current trajectory, each year we don't complete projects like this one, an estimated two to 4,000 of our most vulnerable community members will experience not only an immediately devastating crisis, but statistically, their risk of heart disease and lung cancer will triple. Their life expectancy will decrease by an average of 20 years. They'll be twice as likely to struggle with substance dependency, four and a half times more likely to experience severe depression, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, 11 times more likely to be arrested for juvenile criminal behavior, and 70% more likely to commit a violent crime. And the toxic exposure this project will prevent isn't related to a deadly virus or chemical, it's childhood trauma. Its increasing presence is evidenced every day in our community's schools, our streets, our hospitals, and our prisons. And the scars are not only heartbreaking, they hobble our long-term ability to thrive. Now, uh, this won't come as a surprise to anyone who knows this, what we do, but as a result of the widespread post-pandemic toxic cocktail of increased stressors, 2020 and 2021 have become watershed years for a family place. In the past year alone, thanks to overwhelming community support, our relief nursery program engaged more than 600 local children and their families in a time-tested program with an over 95% success rate. That means on average, over 95% of the families who enroll in relief nursery classrooms, formerly at the highest risk, of abuse and neglect remain safe and aligned for a brighter future. No abuse, no neglect, and no foster care placements. Because a family place is the only organization focused solely on child abuse prevention in Newburgh, we know that to continue this upward trend amid the massive post-pandemic influx of families experiencing toxic levels of stress, Decentralizing services and building community-centric program capacity, like this project in Newburgh, is absolutely critical. It's our hope that as forward-thinking community representatives, you'll make the choice to partner with us in this urgent effort. Thank you, Joy. Um, um, uh, my name is Jordan Robinson. I'm the District Director for Lutheran Community Services, and I've been in that role for 15 years. So the request before you um, that we are excited to present will enable a family place to complete renovations to a new facility centered in one of Newburgh's most highly stressed neighborhoods. The site will have the capacity to provide critical, critical child abuse prevention services to about 300 children and families every year, effectively doubling the size of our reach in Newburgh. Um, this location, um, selected by our leadership council as really being a, a great fit for these services, will focus on mitigating stressors directly linked to the risk of child abuse, directly linked to domestic violence as well. Through a comprehensive suite of services available to children and their caretakers will be available both in English and in Spanish, out of this facility, we will be able to operate um, our school and community-based mental health programs. Um, we will provide basic need support, including diapers and clothing. Um, we will offer intensive parent coaching. 
um, therapeutic home visiting and classroom um, and kindergarten readiness programs, as well as emergency respite care for families in extreme crisis. We've, we've linked together uh, a array of services um, to, to really support families in a comprehensive way. In sum, we're expanding the reach of a program designed to move beyond treatment of symptoms alone, but as Joy mentioned, focused on prevention, on preventing the root causes of childhood trauma and the downstream impact of that trauma. So through wraparound support during this critical point in a child's development, the first five years, and um, in a pivotal point in the, our community's COVID recovery process, um, we will be able to support families and prevent further damage. So our original estimates for this project um, had us coming in at a, a cost of about half a million dollars. Um, and our same estimator, um, after um, a few years, we had, we had actually reached that initial goal. We thought we had reached the finish line. And due to three variables um, that, that have really um, increased the cost of the program, number the one, first variable is increased um, cost associated with permitting and some requirements that came with that permitting from the city. Um, we've all heard about uh, supply chain and, and, and material costs increasing and labor costs. And also some, um, we completed a project in Willamina, similar partnership with schools and, and we did some learning. And so we did have some increased scope of the project. Uh, the costs are now up to a little over um, a million creating a, a significant um, deficit of $535 thousand dollars. So as a result, to avoid further delay um, at this time of, of increased need, um, we're asking for 400,000 from the city of Newburgh um, and we'll be looking for an additional 135,000 in community support to complete this project. Um, our, our current location, um, we we are not able to reach the need in the community. Um, we are not in a convenient location where families can access services. So we really feel like this is an essential uh, project, both to expand our reach um, and to reach as many families as we can, and also to do so in a, in a location that is much more accessible and conducive uh, to families seeking um, the services. And, and it also allows us to partner with uh, the school district and, and the highest poverty school, um, elementary school um, that the school district has. So um, I think that's the end of our presentation. Joy, do you have anything to add before we take questions? Well, that's it. Okay, questions in the room? Patrick or Greg online? Um, yes, I, I just have a, a, a question. This um, this relief nursery, this is um, one of 40 or so Oregon relief nurseries, right? This is an established program following sort of the Oregon relief nursery protocols. Yeah, while we would love to claim full credit for the model, we, we are standing on the shoulders of, of the people who come before us. So there's 40 years of of proven outcomes um, that we have replicated uh, in our community with, with some local flavor, um, like we distribute diapers, uh, thanks to the generosity of the community. We do some things differently, but we are largely uh, cutting and pasting a model that's proven to work. Excellent. Well, I, I just want to say it's a fantastic program. I'm, I'm very familiar with the network and, and the outcomes that, that come and, and uh, just um, I think it's great that we're finally getting something like that in Newburgh or that we have it in Newburgh. Thank you. Other questions? I just have one, which is, um, oh, student, sorry. I thought you were rubbing your mask. You have to come to the microphone. Just going on with like what you asked for the ones earlier. Uh, what's the scope of a partial funding in this? Like, how is that going to affect it? 
Um, good, good question. So um, the, the, we are not able to sort of trim the size in order to meet the needs of our program. We do need to carry out the entire renovations. So the, the result of partial funding would be delay um, our ability to, to do this expansion as we would sort of circle our wagons um, and, and, and figure out where to find the rest of the money. We, like we've mentioned, we've already raised uh, half a million dollars for this project. Um, so it would be, we would circle our wagons for a good while to, to, to look at where else we might need to look. Sure, thanks. Okay, and then uh, along that same line, um, there's 135,000 yet to be gotten in order for you to go ahead. Is that correct? You've got more that fundraising is, to do? That, that is correct. There's a little bit left. Uh, we've, we've been uh, turning over all the rocks and we have a couple of really good leads for that as well. We, before we even brought this number uh, to this group tonight, uh, we wanted to make sure that, that we would be able to complete the project knowing that, that there um, are complexities when uh, funding is awarded uh, through ARPA and projects are not completed. So um, while the check's not in, um, uh, we have some really solid leads for that last 135 and, and individuals and foundations who have um, shown past loyalty that have shown a great interest in the completion of this project as well. And as, as Will has been very helpful in this process can testify, we had originally explored asking for the total request um, through this funding um, and really want, wanted to stay in line with other requests and, and, and scaled back our requests and, and Joy has done some great legwork to, to look at other prospects. So we we feel confident that this is the right size of this request, and we have a plan for the rest. Although not not inked not inked checks checks yet. You know, I just wanted to make a, a shout out to our own Mister Diaper Brian Love and his diaper drive. So big love for, uh, for Brian Love. There you go. It's great. I really. I mean. It to, to your point, this community has supported us immensely over um, the time, you know, the past eight years that we've been established in Yamhill County. I mean, even in comparison to other relief nurseries across the state, we've grown um, and expanded to meet the need. And this project was actually in the hopper prior to uh, the pandemic. So this was something that our community knew we needed to um, expand services in Newburgh and has really stepped forward to make that happen. Not just our community, though, but um, outside of our community and across the state of Oregon, there are so many foundations and individuals that are really pulling um, for our community and uh, want to make sure that this project is is going to be completed um, because they understand, especially post pandemic, the highlight on the um, the spike in need is very real for policymakers, for individuals, and for foundations. Um, we just know that kids are at much greater risk um, with with that that cocktail that has been introduced through the pandemic. Excellent, thank you. Any final questions? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, up next is the Bypass Trail Project, CPRD. They're online. Online. Who would be presenting from CPRD? Good evening. Give us a moment to get into position. Tech is on one side of the room and Cat's presenting on is on the other. I'm Kat Ricker. I'm here with Don Clemens and Casey Creighton. And we would like to talk to you about our proposal for Phase one construction of the Newburgh Dundee Bypass Trail. CPRD has entered into an agreement with ODOT for a community PAS grant for the Newburgh Dundee Bypass Trail Phase one. This trail, like the bypass above it, will connect Newburgh to Dundee, making this busy traffic artery completely transversible by pedestrians and bicyclists for the first time, thus providing much needed connections for work, commerce, and recreation, as well as improving safety and emergency access. 
CPRD began this project over 10 years ago, and it could prove one of CPRD's most ambitious projects yet and change the shape face of our community. ODOT's calculated TDI score of 1.4068 for the area in which this project is located. This reflects that adjacent neighborhoods have relatively high numbers of disabled people and low income families. This path will provide active transportation connectivity that is not available currently. The Corona pandemic has increased the de demand for and usage of outdoor recreation spaces, parks and trails by exponential degrees. And this was the case within our community for CPRD recreation resources. In light of this acute demand, coupled with the nationwide rising popularity of trails as tracked in Oregon's comprehensive outdoor recreation plan and various nationwide research resources, we believe our agency has a responsibility to pursue trail projects, including the bypass trail. And we believe we are being responsive to community needs created by the pandemic by promoting a healthier living environment, outdoor recreation and socialization, and mitigating the spread of COVID-19. This will serve as a connection point for commuting, commuting between communities. Phase one will connect an existing network of 9,800 linear feet of sidewalks and bike lanes east of Highway 219 to provide a 3.2 mile pedestrian bike corridor. There are employment centers at the east end of the corridor and residential areas at the west end. Completion of the full development will provide a safe and attractive and primarily physically separated path connection between Newburgh and Dundee. This project is needed to provide a safe east-west connection for pedestrians and bicyclists over Hess Creek Canyon. This phase one construction will safely connect Newburgh residents to schools, employment centers, civic areas, and parks. Winooski south of the bypass is a two-lane road that is 35 feet wide. The proposed speed limit is 40 mile, 45 miles per hour, and the road does not have sidewalks or bike lines. The crash report indicates a total of four crashes along Winooski over the period of January 2015 through December 2019. We are requesting 400,000 in ARPA funds from City of Newburgh for an investment in the match of the total project cost of $2,600,200 for phase one. CPRD has agreed to contribute 30% of matching funds in the amount of $763,950. The Newburgh Dundee Bypass Trail, an application for the Community Paths Grant, which we have entered into an agreement with, with ODOT, has been endorsed by the Yamhill County Parkway Committee and worked on with the Parkway Committee for over a decade. Also so endorsed by City of Newburgh, Yamhill County Commissioner Casey Pula, Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue, Friends of Yamhill, Yamhalis West Sider Trail, and Taste of Newburgh. You can find their letters of support on our website for that community has grant. This concludes the nuts and bolts of the proposal that we have before you. We would like to answer any questions you might have and thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you about this project tonight. Questions from committee? Scanning the room. Okay, uh, nudging folks on the bridge, Patrick and Greg. I guess it's a Zoom, not a bridge, you know. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, up next, coming in is our animal shelter meet and greet proposal. Okay. Okay. Hi. Ooh. Okay. Ready? Off you go. Off I go. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for taking time to let me speak to the budget committee. Uh, my name is Leona Sandow. I'm the new executive director at Newburgh Animal Shelter. I've been there since in the fall, and uh, we've we're trying to make lots of changes and improvements in order to help the animals better in Newburgh and Dundee. <clears throat> As you, I'm gonna kind of read a little bit over this, which I think you guys already have received. Um, we're a non-for-profit 501c3, and we, our job is to house, provide medical treatment, including spay and neutering, and protect displaced, surrendered, and lost animals until they find, we find their forever homes. Our funds are strictly relied on adoptions, fundraisers, and donations in order to have the means to provide the care needed for the animals in Newburgh and Dundee. We're just like every other business that was hurt by the effects of COVID with the shutdowns because we, um, we potentially rely on, again, donations and fundraisers and just to give you an example, our 2021 fundraising event, we budgeted $84,000 to bring in, and we only earned $44,562. So the income is being diminished because of COVID, and the animals still need to be taken care of. And we don't adopt any animal out until they've been spayed, neutered, vaccinated, and chipped. So that's quite expensive, even with our partnering vets here in town and in McMinnville through Homeward Bound, they help us out with the spay and neutering. Um, one of the things that we have discovered is that we don't have a safe environment place for the public and for the animals to come in and do meet and greets. We have limited space in inside the shelter. We've since built two offices or a big office that people are gonna be sharing. So now our lobby is even smaller than it was before. So when people come in to adopt an animal, there has to be a meet and greet. And if they have a pet, especially a dog, only a dog really, if they have other dogs, we cannot adopt our animals out until those dogs have met with the potential dog that we're gonna adopt out. So sometimes that's upwards to four dogs or three dogs in our little tiny lobby. So the board of directors and I, we've been working on a plan to build an outdoor meet and greet area. So it would be safer for the public and safer for the staff and safer for our animals. So they can meet outside as long as the weather's permitting. And today, I don't wanna take up a lot of your time. Today, what I'm asking for is, um, most humbly asking for, um, for $14,191.83. And that is in order for us to build an outdoor meet and greet area. And it, what's entailed in that is not anything that's luxurious. It's the fencing chain link uh, we want to put some barrier on one end um, to keep the dogs from trying to, with traffic in the public, keep everybody safe. And then all the gates, because we have to double gate instead of single gate. And then the rock, and the cheapest rock we found was three quarter minus, which is what we want to go with because the uh, pea gravel gets in the dog's little pads and it really causes them harm. So um, that is what we're asking. I have the bids attached. Uh, I think that this is a growth that we need for the shelter and for our animals. And that's what I'm requesting tonight. I don't wanna take up too much of your time. 
And I'm open to questions. Questions from committee? Rick? All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you first for your, for your good works. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned, and I guess I'm just trying to understand this, maybe not specifically to this request, but more broadly. So you mentioned your relationship with Homeward Bound Pets um, and spay and neuter. Is there additional relationship besides the spay and neuter program? And, and do you have an idea of what the cost of that is? Do you know? For the spay and neutering? Uh -huh. No, our part, the reason we partner with uh, Newberg um, or with Homeward, Homeward Bound at times uh -huh. is because our partnering vets here in town, uh, Dr. Tripp is our partnering vet that oversees with us, works with us. Uh -huh. um, their bandwidth is completely packed. Right. Um, so we go, our first choice is always, will always be Newburgh vet mm -hmm. and family pet. Okay. But there were four vets here in town and now we're down to two. And like right now we're up against kitten season and right. puppy season where everybody's being born. We had our first, we launched it this week and um, they just don't have this, they just don't have enough staff or resources. So we have to go wherever it can be to get our animals spayed and neutered. Okay. Otherwise they're in shelter a lot more, a lot longer than we want them in there. Um, something I've learned about shelter life with these animals, especially with the dogs, even the cats, that the longer they're in there, the more stressed they become. Mm -hmm. And when they become stressed, they will become dangerous at times. And so our goal is to keep them in the shelter as little time as possible. So for an example, they want us, um, I reached out to get some kittens spayed and neutered with family pet, and that was last week. The soonest they can take five kittens is March 17th. That's how far out. We're looking at a month out for oh, all the vets. So, so Homeward Bound, uh -huh. they we will drive animals there. They have a spot open for us every other Tuesday, but we still have to pay them, but we don't have any other partnership with them, just the spay and neuter. Okay. You're welcome. Other questions? Greg and Patrick. I'm uh, good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll get out as quick as I can, but it's slow. <laughs> I just graduated off of a scooter onto a cane. <laughs> so I'm a little slower. Still, oh, you can use the chair. Scoot out. Oh, no, 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 I would never do that. <laughs> that would be too embarrassing. <laughs> okay. okay, next up is the social goods street seating. Hi, hi. <laughs> Well, I'm going to see two. Looks like we're still on. Hi, my name is Robin, and this is my husband, Danny. Um, if you don't know, we own Social Goods just right down the way. Um, and we're asking for funding for street seats, which is um, something that brings the community together. Outdoor seating also for COVID purposes and inclusion. And... Um, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> you were supposed to do the introduction. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we were, we're floored. I mean, the amazing projects that are before us today are, are huge. And we're looking at these and going, we're, you know, Robin looks at me and says, we're just a small mom and pop shop. And I'm going, yeah, you know, we, we are. But then I started thinking, wait, we're so much more than that. Over the course of the last half decade that we've been around and adding to the community, we have been a focal point in bringing all these different purposes together from outdoor activity, a spot where families can come together in a peaceful way that's inclusive, mm -hmm. that's, that brings everyone, uh, regardless of background. We've had uh, politicians to the first place that somebody goes with a newborn. We've had a wedding happen. We've had uh, first dates. I think we probably had some last dates, but you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we posted numerous nonprofits throughout the county. Uh, we try to do that at least every month, something that goes back to the community in one way or another. Um, this, the, the drawing that you have in your hands is not, it's an older drawing. Over the past month and a half, we've been working with McKinsey and Associates in downtown Portland to help. And they're professional. They're the ones yeah. who do these outdoor scenes and make it. Landscape architects. <laughs> and they make it beautiful. They make it a, a piece of art that's, that's a focal point that increases uh, the, uh, the people's want to go and sit there and make it an attractive spot. And so we like, all right, now we want to keep this dream alive. We have an opportunity to be in front of you. And it is so hard right now as a for-profit business to be able to obtain anything outside of our scope of, of, of earnings. So we, we peddle food and, and, and beer and wine and, and, and fun. But I mean, outside of that, there's not a whole lot of avenues. This would be able to be a multiple faceted uh, solution. Uh, and, and is it okay? Is Can it we? okay if I pass out? Then I would do it. Okay. These are our newest drawings that we have for you. They're a bit more, um, they're prettier. You have more information. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can share one. Okay, go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you. So what we're looking at to do is to have an outdoor seating spot that still continues to tie the community together. Uh, a spot where if there's a fundraiser, if there's a uh, benefit, if there's a meeting, a birthday, uh, we can still do that in a COVID safe, friendly and aware uh, inclusive spot. We're looking at this to be a spot that is a, uh, um, a piece of art that you see on 99 as where it's located would be uh, right down the street and it would see uh, tourists uh, would see it, people coming from the coast would see it and it would just increase uh, the way our downtown looks. It would be a walking, uh, an incentive for people to go out walking. It's a spot where uh, we're offering bike repair so we'll have a little spot where uh, there will be a pump and some uh, tools. So those of us who enjoy going outside, if you had a flat tire, this would be a great spot for them to be able to fix that. Um, moreover, we're looking at this as a spot to include animals and dogs. There'll be a spot where you can be there and enjoy a nice uh, cup of coffee or a cold one with your furry friend, if that's who you're on your date with. You know, I would. Um, <laughs> I think but, it would be neat to be able to do some of the... Uh, Nonprofit events that we usually do with animal shelters and whatnot, and, and we just got finished talking about animal shelters, but they could actually bring their dogs to these events this time, or cats, and no, we could yeah. really make something of it. Uh, in addition to that, with the hit of COVID, we lost uh, 150 catering contracts within 48 hours. Um, we had to furlough 11 employees. Uh, we had to um, uh, renegotiate contracts with vendors. And we, uh, we figured out how to do 40 hours and 24 hours to try to keep the dream alive of that, that spot downtown. We're in a beautiful old building and we don't wanna see anything negative ever happen to it. We wanna increase its uh, attractiveness and we want it to be a spot that everyone wants to be at and be a part of. So what happened during the furlough is we pay our employees a very good living wage. Not a lot of restaurants can do that because it's a razor, razor thin margin. By being able to have this spot, we'd be able to increase three full-time jobs. So we'd be bringing that back. That's tax revenue that's coming back in. That's the abilities for people to be able to have a great source of income with a mom and papa shop, if not be a stepping stone to their own career path. We, um, uh, we look at this as a community benefit. Um, yes, we'll be selling food and, and beverage out there, but that's a small piece of it. It's gonna increase our um, relevance as a, a a spot and a destination in wine country. And uh, I would really like to sit there and enjoy a beer myself too. So. <laughs> yeah, it would be really nice to be the second street seats. I know that Reddick has them and we've had this dream for a while and hopefully this will make it come to fruition. I mean, it would mean everything to us if this does get funded. Uh, and there are so many things that it can do to benefit the community. And especially because also outdoors with COVID that those people that are still afraid to go indoors can have a safe spot and a comfortable spot. And with the architect firm that we have lined up with this, we can make it beautiful. <laughs> really, really nice. Hey, Molly, you can see us talk all day long if you let us know. Sorry. <laughs> Many heartfelt things here. Um, questions from committee? Rick? This question may be more for staff than for you all, but uh, I did planning review this one just to take a look. Okay. Thank you. That's all. 
if I could answer in addition with that, not only is planning responded to us, but the gentleman who we had a communication with is no longer with us. We elevated this to the firm that Robin was talking about who does this professionally. And they have the questions to those uh, concerns from our original submission answered and, and, and then some. Yes, and when we originally proposed this before COVID hit and we didn't have the funds to go through with it, uh, we'd already talked to ODOT because we know it is on a bus line and it has been approved by ODOT to um, do the street seat. Mm -hmm. And we also are fully aware of the MOU. Like we 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 know it involves you. Know. Wow. <laughs> um, questions from uh, Greg and Patrick. <laughs> um, Mayor Rick uh, Rogers uh, asked the questions I had. So, good job, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good straight man. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Guys. Thank you so much. We're so honored to be able to present this today. So thank you and good luck. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's a long time to wait, but thank you for waiting. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I think I think we have to declare a conflict of interest there. Okay. Okay. Next up is the um, bullet resistant windows. We have Chief Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Krasmicki, Chief of Police for Newburgh Dundee Police Department. First of all, thank you all for being here and volunteering your time. Um, there's one thing I noticed I got left off. Uh, the forty thousand eight hundred dollars is an estimate for the polycarbonate bullet resistant uh, replacement windows for the public safety, uh, basically the records area out here. There's also, um, it's, it's a riot or slash bomb proofing uh, the public safety customer lobby area. So all the glass work out here, um, it, it would, there's another $28,000 estimate to that. So total ask would be 68,800. Um, the bullet resistant glass uh, provides police stations with a higher level of security needed while at the same time allowing a modern and pleasing uh, interior. Keeping visitors, records staff, and police officers out of harm's way is our top priority, but we need to accomplish this without creating an intimidating atmosphere. We can accomplish this with the bullet resistant glass and shatter resistant window film is, and I'll just refer to it as uh, window film from this point forward. It's a mouthful. Um, uh, the window, so the polycarbonate, I think everyone knows, I won't go into too much detail. I know you guys are busy. Uh, it's just really thick glass that is bullet resistant. Um, and we uh, are looking at probably like a level five. So probably a little over, an, uh, right, a, right around an inch and a half thick. So it still looks like glass. It's not, you know, too, too uh, intimidating or anything like that. Um, the window film is typically applied to existing windows to reduce those windows from fragmenting during either a bomb blast or uh, someone trying to forcibly take it out with a bat or something like that, you know, like during a riot. Um, and uh, if you would have asked me four or five years ago, I would say, hey, there's no way that's going to happen in Newburgh. However, um, I know that Tigard had uh, just last year in 20, I think, I think it was January 21, they had a use of force issue that occurred um, and there were people that came down and broke out all the windows and they estimated the damage at about a hundred thousand um, dollars. And so uh, fast forward to 22, uh, I would say this is, this is pretty good insurance um, to keep people out of this building. Um, and the, the public safety building, as you can see, is a multi-use, has a multi-use uh, room, which we're in currently. Um, it hosts council meetings, business meetings, both city and uh, we let people come in and, and have business meetings through uh, that are community members, muni court, municipal court. Um, and it is the primary emergency operations center for the city. Um, it also received about an $800,000 seismic upgrade. Uh, and I think that was in 2020. Um, it's important to mention also that I think if this building was built today and most police departments these types of access points are uh, have the, these um, upgrades or you know almost standard at this point. 
Um, and that's really the, the entire ask. And I'm, I'm, does anybody have any questions on? You know, Patrick has something. Yeah, I, I know. Say, come on, Patrick. We're I just on. unmuted. That's, that was amazing. He read my mind. Affectionately, Pat. Are they uh, are, are currently, are, and I don't want to cause a security issue, but um, currently what is uh, equipped in the windows right now? Uh, I'm sorry. Was, what you have right now is just glass. glass. That's it. No, okay. no security features whatsoever. And, and to give folks a... Well, that's not true. Security cameras as well and the recording. So we do have those, but uh, there's nothing that would prevent someone from coming in. The um, to give people a sense of uh, scale here, the Oregon Lottery just their Wilsonville office was just glass, and we recently updated um, the the windows there and and even put in ballistic drywall. Um, so there is uh, uh, in in the same with Salem, and we're not you know a police agency. We're just a uh, you know hopefully people are happy when they come visit. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, but uh yeah <laughs> well you know i'm remote working now, so there's, there's a better chance they're going to be happy because i'm remote working now but um the uh uh the other question i had for you was um have you had any incidents in the lobby where that was a concern in the last let's say five years uh we've had uh backpacks and things of that nature left around uh so we had we have had to evacuate the building uh, thank goodness we've not had any incidents. Um, you know, we, we have not had any incidents that proved to be uh, real, but we have had to evacuate because we would have done that anyway with evacuation, but this would provide clearly, you know, much more safety. And, you know, if you're looking at a, um, well, like a rioting situation or something like that, uh, people not being able to get into the building could uh, provide us with other options rather than, you know, making a really bad, um, someone making a really bad decision and us having to react with a really lethal amount of force. Thank you. <laughs> Just a comment from the chair. We've really missed you, Patrick. Just saying that. I think you're the only ones. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. <laughs> All in favor? No, wait. All right. Thank you. I think Thank that's you. it. Great. Okay, up next, uh, 1.5 million for water rights purchase. Off you go, Karen, you have five minutes. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Budget Committee Council. Um, I'm Karen Hoffman, I'm City Engineer uh, for the City of Newburgh. And I'm here to talk about um, the city of Newburgh redundant water supply, specifically the water rights purchase. Um, for those of you who don't know, the city's current water supply is, on the well, is a well field on the south side of the Willamette River. Um, and if there is, um, if something was to happen to that well field, the city would have uh, no water available to provide to its citizens. <clears throat> So a secondary redundant source of water is vital to the community, its residents, business, schools, churches, and nonprofit organizations. Um, the council uh, gave direction that the redundant water supply should have an approximate capacity of four to eight million gallons per day. Um, average is uh, two and a half million in through the winter time and about four to four and a half in the summertime. Um, and so in July of 2020, the council gave direction to secure water rights and property as part of the local Willamette alternative for our safe and reliable water future. This water right um, that we are looking to purchase um, allows for um, eight CFS or 5.17 million gallons of water, um, of water rights on the Willamette River. And in January, the council um, agreed on terms with a purchase agreement of uh, $3,185,435 for those water rights. Their request is for uh, $1.5 million and the remaining balance will be drawn from other internal sources that 
will be determined water rates, um, water SDCs, um, and that type of thing. So with that, I will stop there and. Okay, questions from council, budget committee? Rick's taking care of you, Patrick. Yeah, sorry. sorry oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm channeling you right now. So um, I think you touched on this, Karin, but so if a partial funding, if it were partial funding, say we funded a million, um, would that, that would be an impact then on SDC, water SDCs and rates? Is that That's correct. correct to understand? Okay. Thanks so much. But it is possible, right? Correct. Thank you. Greg or Patrick? Yeah, I, I did have a, a couple questions. Um, Karn, how often do these water rights become available? Is this something that I can just call up by Amazon and, and uh, get some water rights? Or is this something that's fairly uh, exclusive? They are pretty exclusive. Um, they, uh, and they're getting more and more scarce. Um, other entities are continuing to buy water rights. Um, water is, is the next big thing really. Um, and looking at sources of water, we should really be looking 50 to hundred years out as much as possible. Um, so, uh, Willamette Water and Light just bought water rights on the Willamette River also. Um, so we were very lucky to, to be able to acquire these right with, um, the possible diversion here in town. Um, which makes it very easy for us to make those transfers and make that water happen. Um, the other thing I'll note uh, in case anybody asks is that these water rights that we're looking to buy are a 1927 date of priority, which means it um, precedes just about all the other rights around and it precedes the fish, um, some of the fish regulations and those kinds of things. So other, if water rights were gonna go away on the Willamette River, Others would go away before these would. Uh, follow up, if I might. Um, what are some of the other options for water redundancy? Um, I seem to remember rattling around in my brain that pipelines from either Wilsonville, Sherwood, or McMinnville were options. And as far as costs go, um, would this be more of an economical um, option, or is this, um, you know? It, Give me kind of a landscape of what the options are and where this falls in, in uh, those options. So, okay, so um, t for the amount of water that we uh, need as a redundant supply, um, groundwater was taken off the table. We just don't have enough other locations near here that we could acquire that much water. So yet we were looking at a surface water right of some kind. Um, and we looked at a local option and also a regional option, as, as you noted, Patrick, which would be either, um, you know, bringing a pipeline from, from Wilsonville or the Sherwood system or from Willan or the McMinnville system. Um, each one of those is about 12 miles of pipeline that would have to be constructed. Um, and that's not off the table for future, but the council really asked us to look at local first um, going with a local option really gives us the control over the water right. Um, when, we're, when we buy into somebody else's system, we're uh, beholden to them about what they want, how much they want, all of those types of things. Whereas this, we're in control of our own destiny. Um, so the council had said they wanted us to do local rights first, but continue to explore that future regional option to really um, bring those other options to, to Newburgh um, long-term. Did that answer okay. all those questions? Other questions? I think that's all I had. Okay. Um, ignorance on my part. So if this doesn't go through with ARPA funds, do you have other alternatives for funding this? Because you, you were planning on doing this before there was ever ARPA, right? Correct. Okay. I, I'm trying to understand yeah. that other. So yes, we were planning to do this anyway. Um, there have been other complications that have occurred um, that are gonna take additional water, right, uh, water money. Um, so, which may 
will most likely mean having to go out for financing. And so this would reduce the need for financing for those future projects. I won't say financing will go away because it probably will not, but it will reduce the amount that we have to finance. Okay. Okay, other question? That's it, thank you. Yeah. Okay, next up is uh, Nimble Marketing online. Please Hello. go ahead. Hello. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Amanda Green, and Georgia Conrad is here, too. We're co-owners of Nimble Marketing. And um, thank you all very much. We really appreciate getting this opportunity to speak about this project. We're really excited. Um, it's been wonderful listening to all the cool projects everyone has presented tonight, too. It's really exciting. Um, so a little bit about us. Uh, we, our headquarters are located in Dundee, Oregon, and our main service is visual media. So that includes creating and maintaining websites, doing branding and graphic design, photography, and even more so, we always find other ways of helping our clients out. Um, and we serve and support over 50 small businesses and nonprofits in Oregon right now. So because of the impact of the pandemic, local businesses, nonprofits, and the tourism industry really has suffered just the lack of business and the seasonal visitors everyone is used to. And we've noticed there's just been a really clear shift. <laughs> we've all noticed uh, there's just most more things are happening online um, than ever in the past. And um, over the last few years, we've really been able to help a lot of our clients convert their businesses and organizations to be more online friendly so that they can keep working and growing and prospering even during these hard times. And there are many more businesses and organizations who really need help growing their online presence. And this is where we come in. We see a way that we can really help some local businesses with this. So we're requesting funding to help five to 10 Newburgh businesses get back online so that they can improve tourism awareness and promote e-commerce alternatives when, you know, in-person business has really been impacted. And another great thing about this project is it's really scalable. You know, we put five to 10, but we know there's a lot of need. So, you know, we can grow and we'd love to assist more businesses and nonprofits in the area um, through online business, um, e-sales and, and any services that we can really help with. Um, so what we'd like to do is propose an RFP process to identify local businesses and nonprofits and community members, particularly um, from BIPOC and Latinx um, X and other marginalized communities who just need an online makeover or to just get a project started. Maybe they are starting from scratch and just have a great idea that they want to grow into a business. Or maybe it's a business that's already established and they just need a chance to boost what they currently have and grow from what they already have in place. So realistically, this could look like, let's say, um, getting an online store set up for a business who doesn't have one already. So then they wouldn't have to rely on people walking through their door. They can sell things online. Another is redesigning a website that might be a little out of date. So it could have, we could help them achieve a modern look and have modern features and capabilities on their website. Um, this could also include doing an online presence review. So maybe they have a great website already, but there's not a lot of people going to it. We can help them find ways to build their traffic, get more people coming to their website. Another thing that we can really help with is setting up modern online features. So this could, let's say an Airbnb or a hotel, they need help with online booking. They don't have any way for people to book online. We can help that with something like that. Or if it's a local nonprofit who needs help setting up online donations, we can help with that too. And then there's tons of other ways we can help. We There's Whenever we meet a new client or someone who um, is looking for help with their online presence, we have lots of different ideas and ways that we can help their individual situation so that they can really grow and thrive 
and build that online presence so they get more people interested in what they're doing. Um, so basically helping local businesses and nonprofits and community members um, by helping them build this positive online presence, they can thrive and really take things to the next level. And that will have a positive impact on our whole community. Um, we're hoping really we can help some local nonprofits and people in the tourist industry and businesses that are downtown and, and all sorts of other ones that we can think of. Um, I just want to call out one specific thing that we uh, said in our proposal that we were willing to um, do a dollar for dollar match. So, um, you know, with the ARPA funds, we will um, match the projects. Uh, there's skin in the game for the business. Uh, they're invested into it. That way we know we have sustainability and long-term projects. And um, then we will put in the other for ourselves uh, because of the, the donation process. Um, and that way you get the best bang for your buck and it helps the businesses in the area and we can help more people. Um, I think that's all we have for tonight. Do you have any questions? Yep, question. Can you outline the selection process for the businesses you're gonna help a little more? Um, we can create a um, RFP process and um, you know, kind of an application with a deadline, similar to what you've done here with the ARPA funds. Um, create you know our own deadline, uh, and then we would market it downtown uh, to our connections in the in the local area, um, and then you know, based on the ARPA guidelines, that would be kind of the basis of our selection to so make sure that we are selecting people that qualify, that can show uh, need and uh, prioritize them accordingly. Perfect. Other questions? We'll pick on Greg this time and then Patrick. <laughs> I will point out it is Greg's 31st wedding anniversary, which is, <laughs> so he's probably multitasking. <laughs> no questions here. <laughs> okay. Congratulations, Greg. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> and I didn't have any questions, so thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And last but never least, uh, the Newberg Harvest House. There's a <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for having us. And I first want to disclose that I am declaring conflict of interest as obviously I'm on the budget committee, um, but I will say that I receive no financial gain from any of these funds if awarded. And um, do you also want to? Yeah. <laughs> this is a group effort. <laughs> so these are potential conflicts of interest being disclosed. Right. Well, I, I also need to declare a potential <laughs> conflict. I am a paid contractor for Harvest House, but it's designated that I would not receive any of my salary from any ARPA funds receipt. Excellent. And to be clear, we have awarded outside grants for Councillor Findlay's contracted salary. So thanks for having us today, Elise Yarnell Holloman, in this capacity, um, President of Community Wellness Collective, which is the financial um, sponsor of Newburgh Harvest House. And I'm Dr. Jerry Turgeson. I'm a board certified health psychologist and I work for Providence and have the opportunity to provide behavioral health support at the Harvest House one night a week. So we are here today and I'm sure you've 
all read your packet, so I won't <laughs> read it. Um, but wanted to talk to you first and foremost, say that we are standing on the shoulders of a lot of people that have gone before us and a lot of involvement in Harvest House. I would be remiss to say our dear counselor, um, Denise Bacon, was really at the formation stages of the Newburgh Emergency Shelter. And um, my hope and goal for today is that um, we can demonstrate um, the real intention to take this to a sustainable model that is here for decades to come in the Newburgh community. Also, I thought it would be important, as we know, we funded YCAP um, last session mm -hmm. meeting, and um, we are a subgrant of, or a right, a, a sub a subgrant of YCAP. So they actually they own Harvest House, the building, the, the house. And we're working really closely, um, multiple organizations in the community that all do similar work, either around housing, mental health support, chemical dependency access, to really do what we're calling capacity building and to lean into each other's strengths and not duplicate services. Um, and so YCAP recognized community wellness collectives um, space in the Newburgh community. Um, they... Um, did not have the bandwidth to run a low barrier shelter, but wanted to have a low barrier shelter. And a low barrier shelter really meaning that we welcome anyone that comes to the doors as long as they're able to um, commit to the um, respectful behaviors that we outline. Um, that is a huge need in our community that has been unmet um, for many years. And so we, um, another shelter is the Mission, which is a great organization as well not a low barrier shelter, but also a great organization, McMinnville. So often, myself included, we want to try to find the silver bullet for houselessness or for homelessness. And um, I have quickly realized that there is not one, sadly. And um, putting my Providence hat on, my, my community wellness collective hat, um, I just feel implored as a community member to have multiple different solutions in our community for different scenarios that we're presented with. And so this is really what we consider the front door to supporting long-term placement or, supportive, or, or a more supportive housing model. Really important to us is wraparound services. So to do this well, we do not want to be a place that someone comes in and out of and doesn't feel fully cared for holistically. So we have quickly stood up. We, we opened as a five day a week shelter from Tuesday, or sorry, from Thursday to Tuesday, 8 p.m. to 8, 8 a.m. Quickly, um, and I would have some numbers here. So volunteer hours for last year were 2,788. Um, so volunteer hours to keep the doors open five days a week. Um, we quickly within one year um, moved to a seven day a week shelter and are open 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. We have also hired contract employees in our community wellness collective to fully staff the services so that our volunteers, um, we can operate without volunteers if we need to. So the ask in front of you today is to stabilize that staffing for a year. So $250,000 is the staffing for the year and will also allow us to open 24 hours. This will allow us with our current staff to um, to put them through peer support training through OHA, which is a huge, huge benefit both for them and for the um, for our houseless guests. Um, I can attest as a person in recovery, it is a huge opportunity for these um, shelter employees that we have to go through this type of training. Um, they will then also be able to provide those peer support services during the day. We're moving forward with AA and NA groups on site. We have great um, relationships with the, the, the different um, churches and faith-based organizations in our community to really partner um, and provide a space that many organizations feel they can be a part of. And then um, super also to mention in here is the prescription fund. You would be super surprised at the amount of high risk physical medical cases that come through our door. We have on-site behavioral health therapy through Jerry for Dr. Ferguson, and then medical care through Dr. Swindle, who's the medical director at New, uh, Providence Medical Group Newburgh. He provides those services, as does Jerry, on-site weekly for, from 6.30 p.m. till 11 p.m. Pretty amazing investment that they're willing to do once a week, and it has been life-changing. So the prescription fund really allows these patients to have bridge care. Um, insulin, you know, 
the, the type of medicines that people really cannot live without and exacerbate their situation. Something, that, something really exciting is also that we've been um, working with um, Street of Dreams. And so the, the $75,000 that is listed is to expand and be able to add an additional 10 beds. So right now we are able to house safely 22 beds. This would bring us to 32 beds um, to grow to support the need in the community. Um, and so we would be their give back, pro, their, their give back project um, and they do a matching fund um, opportunity. And I just talked about this. No, that's okay. Um, I think one of the things that's been really meaningful about this project is that it is a, a step into supported, trauma-informed supported living for individuals who have really complex needs. And so I always love patient stories because I feel like they just help to kind of give some representation around the work that we're trying to do. So we have a patient who has been at the shelter. She is there every single night, um, has a severe history of adverse childhood experiences that started in her early childhood um, was houseless by the age of 14 and has had multiple sexual assaults as part of that. Moved to Oregon with an unsafe partner and then has been houseless ever since. Actively using methamphetamine as a way to treat her trauma so that she can stay awake at night because she has felt really unsafe to sleep anywhere within our community. And so, with that, we then have this space that there have been, unfortunately and understandably, multiple police interactions given recurrent and ongoing methamphetamine use. She's regularly in the emergency department with complex health needs. Having a safe space where she can go has been highly empowering for her. She's now at a space where she is five months sober. She is working part-time and has a membership at CPRD and goes to the gym every day where she swims and is really motivated for her health. She also hasn't had an emergency department or any police interaction within the past four months. So I think stories like that really show the complexity around like the situations people are dealing with, how they're trying to cope and having, just having stable housing has created space for sobriety, has created space where we can address trauma, has created space where she can really stabilize her life in a super meaningful way. We could talk all night. Thank you. Questions from committee? <laughs> Everybody wants to talk all night. <laughs> Someone ask us. Before. All right, Patrick, do you have any Yep, questions? I do actually have a question. <laughs> so I... <sighs> Yeah, right. I, you know, hey, yeah, I got to stay uh, in character. Um, so I noticed on the, the materials that you had an ADU extension for the property. Um, and with the discussion earlier of okay. if uh, funds aren't used, um, we would have to pay them back. Um, do you have the proper permits or have you talked with planning um, and, and, where are you at with that process as far as the ADU goes and in the potential um, land use issues that, that could arise? Yeah, so um, it's through um, Portland Home Builders Association is who we'd be working with their foundation. And so um, they would own that whole process and we are not through the final, the final gate. We really need to be able to demonstrate that we can come up with $75,000 of startup funds for them to be able to match through in-kind donations. So um, he, Brenda and Chris have been working on communicating with the city of what that would look like. Um, I will say that um, we could amend it to bring the house up to probably what is considered code. So there are opportunities in the home and it has not been updated in the inside for Many probably years. 20 years. Yeah. Okay, and then a, a, a follow-up to that. Oh, wait, <laughs> Will's coming. See, I'm watching That's on TV too. Hey, hey, Patrick, wait a minute. Let Will weigh in on this question before you go to your next. I just wanted to say through our um, pre-approval process, we did not see significant issues. Woo. <laughs> well, hey, I got you some good news with that question, huh? Um, <laughs> uh, the other question I had as a follow-up to, to that one is, um, this something that you would be willing to put in an MOU to maybe we put that money in, in escrow and then if, if things fall apart, you just give the 75 back and we pay it back totally. to the federal government. I'm not entirely sure how this works. Yeah, we could totally, we could absolutely do something like that. 
Man, I'm not sure escrow is the right term. And the finance director is probably now, you know, cringing and wanting to reach or the camera at me. <laughs> or maybe withhold the funds until, you know, demonstration of permit or something. Yeah. Yeah. Have like an agreement, an MOU or something. I yeah. Think that's okay. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and just as a, uh, a community, you know, f member, um, I really want to thank the the work that that emergency shelter does. And I think it's a great addition to the community. And I cannot speak enough about how many um, hours um, volunteers have put into that thing from back when I first was on council. So I, I think um, seeing it continue to, to thrive and ha even have this opportunity is is a great thing for those people that are in need in our community. So uh, thank you to Denise and Elise and everybody involved with that thing. So thank, thank you so much. And I will just say the cool thing about this is that so many hands are involved in this. This mm -hmm. is, you know, Kara is the one that deserves so much of the credit for seeing this through and really carrying the ball forward. And I mean, Stephanie, I should, should say has been an amazing addition to has the have as a case manager to really connect to the ongoing services. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, oh. Dang it. Patrick, you were supposed to channel. No, go ahead. Rick. Sorry, sorry, Pat. Um, all right. Well, first, first is a question. Then the second is an offer. So the question is, you know, one of the challenges for nonprofits, as you all well know, is operational funds. So you, with this, you can have staffing funds through a year. What's the plan after that? Gosh, dang it. I knew sorry. Get out. Sorry. Yeah. So I have. So my role in this work is to be really building relationships with local partners. And so. I should say as well that Austin Family Foundation, Providence, Providence Community Health Division, Providence Housing Division, YCAP, we, we receive, we have a pretty healthy mix of funding. Um, to be really honest, the 250,000 will allow us to get out from needing to subgrant constantly with YCAP, which is important to the future of our organization. Um, and then the other, you say community partners, this is an offer. Again, I think I've made it before, but if uh, if ever Habitat can be helpful. In we now know what ADU, we need, so I will. If you know, let me, <laughs> yeah. let me know. Thanks. As we have done thorough walkthroughs. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have one other question. Yeah. The house actually belongs to YCAP. Yeah. You're now going to make an investment. Does the investment that you've made in the house now belong to YCAP? I would have guessed so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any <clears throat> anything we should explore in that? If they decide to pull funding from this project, which I'm sure they wouldn't do, but we had this discussion last time they were here that there's nothing in Newburgh except this. I think we help them, quite frankly, meet a lot of their requirements okay. as a cap. And um, so I don't see them wanting to pull no this risk out. There. Yeah. <laughs> Would they, and if not, then maybe we'll try to buy the house. That's <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. You're thinking down that line. Good. Yeah, I mean, so for me, partial funding would look like um, I really want to get our um, our staff peer support trained because it will really open up a lot of doors for us. But I would say, honestly, the 250000 for staffing costs um, with the ability to flex for training would be would be what I would say. Yeah. The minimum you could go with. 250 yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Did you say something? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we're now at a point to take a break. And then we will entertain a motion to do voting. Okay. Right. And threw numbers up there just as a, as a sample. So um, Russ said that EV could be scaled up. You know, a family place, I don't know. That means more fundraising for them, but um, you know, again, they have to raise what a hundred thousand as it is. That would be another hundred thousand for them to raise. Bypass trails, same idea. Um, you know, water rights. Again, that's the biggest animal on the table today, right? So, so that one again, the impact there is going to be water rates, SDCs, right? But it has to be funded, so that might be a possibility. And then Harvest House again, as as Elise said, it's uh, you know staffing and uh, training, so that could be fudged a little bit. But anyway. Those are just some possibilities, and that would allow, I think, if I did the math somewhat right, 
that might allow us to fund almost all of them otherwise, I think. But Katie can check my math. And the only other thing I have is I have a question for Patrick, actually. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Who is on the other foot? Hello, Mr. Johnson. Patrick. I don't, I don't answer questions. I only ask them. So yeah, I apologize for that. that. I don't know. Just a general. Did you, did you notice that there's a, a vacancy on council for district four? Did you notice that? Did you notice that by any chance? I just said, just wanted to point it out in case you hadn't seen that news. Excuse me, Mr. Rogers. Cheers, no, mate. no harassing the volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the, the open, we said last time we wanted a period for open discussion, and this is one of the topics for open discussion, but I wanted to collect others, and I also want to put a time limit on it because there's an angry child at home, I heard, and so, so yeah, <laughs> excellent, angry dogs, I mean, you know, there's a lot of anger in the world, anyway, um, were there any open issues or questions around the projects other than this partial funding thing? I had one. We have these web folks from Dundee, and then we had the web stuff from the downtown chamber. And are they different things? They, well, po possibly going in different directions? Okay, that was one, I just wanted to check with you guys. It seemed like that. Any the, other open issues or questions? I, I do have a couple of questions for the finance director, if I might, um, just because I'm out of uh, practice and uh, a little slow. Um, so if we partially fund things, is that okay? Because I'm a little fuzzy on how that piece works if you could, I'm, I'm really sorry for wasting people's time but if, if you could just explain the partial funding and what the risks rewards are for that i would really appreciate it um the partial funding is a new thing for this round that we were just kind of bouncing around so i think that we would want to make sure that the project was still viable if we were partially funding it that way we're not just giving them money and then they can't actually complete the project and we've given them money and then they would have to potentially give it back or we would have to give it back to the federal government. So I, but as long as we've vetted them and they say they can still complete the project, there's probably no issue with the partial funding. I think the, the extra work uh, that Will mentioned is the MOU has to be rewritten to be in line with the funding. So there is an extra round of effort to be done with the city and the, the person, but it's, it's possible and we wouldn't consider it for anyone who said they couldn't live with less and who told us how much they could live with. So the, the, I'd like to get input from the committee on what you think about going down this path, because what we would do is rewrite the project in the voting for the lesser amount if you agree to go down this path. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna repeat that so it's on the tape, but, or yeah, if you, no, no, really, I like the way you said it. I'm really not interested in that, only because this is what people signed up for. This is what we told them. This is how this process worked. It's not fair to the first group, you know, that, um, so I think we should just follow through. I, I like how it is. I think it's fair. Mike? I, I really appreciate you all chiming in on this because it is a change in midstream, which is always scary. Mr. McBride. Whoa. And Chair. Um, I feel the same way as Denise. I, I think we just ought to go through the process. I don't really want to start looking at partial funding at this point and doing the what if and you know whatever. And then we got to come back and redo everything. I just, I say we'll just go through it. And let's vote and see what happens. Stephanie? Gotta get a mobile mic. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, oh, gotcha. <laughs> Agreed. I don't think when people put together these, they ask for Cadillacs, they ask for Toyotas. And I don't think, I mean, I know they're gonna say, yes, we would take less money um, <laughs> because I think the alternative is no money. Um, but I do, and I also worry about the integrity of the project. So when we're looking at some of these things, 
you, if you only pay for half, you only get half of what like, they told us that they would deliver. And so um, I think we should just see it through the way we've, we've done it so far. Okay. Elise company, I'm going around the room and asking for. We are going to vote on this, so it's good to get your input in. Okay. All right. All or nothing. Okay. RJ. Okay. And uh, Patrick and Greg. I, I don't think you could hurt. <laughs> I'm not being good disciplinarian. Uh, the last two said fully funded or you'll have problems. So Patrick, Greg, comments? I, I'm still contemplating. So I, I see the, the merits of both. So gotcha. uh, again, I'm out of practice. So give me a minute <laughs> to think. You always voted last when I was, anyway, never mind. No questions here. Okay, so do you want to make a motion, Rick? Uh, sure. Uh, hey, at least we're, you know, the people on Zoom are giving the other folks in the room their steps for the day. So there's that. <laughs> yes. But the, the only thing I'll say is, I, and I don't have the information in front of me. I'm not sure how clear with the, the, the funding request was on partial funding or not. It is a standard practice among foundations and grantors to do that. It happens all the time. I don't think it's that cumbersome. But um, anyway, my motion is this. Um, move, move to allow partial funding on certain projects this evening. We have a second. At least second. OK, so I'm going to do a roll call vote because I I want to make sure everyone votes. You could get in the line, or I just have this handy list that Sue gave me. So, I'm really sorry, guys. We've tried to buy more cables twice, oh. and they're like almost unobtainable. And that's why we don't have enough mics for all these positions. I'm sorry. It's good exercise. You're just helping them with their weight loss plan. Okay, um, we're going to go through the the roll call. The motion is, uh, as stated, is to, for the people who said they could do partial funding, not for everybody, but just for those, to change the project to show what they said they could live with, so that we then move to voting. So that's the uh, motion that Rick made, that at least seconded. And now I'm just going to go down, and a yes means you agree with partial funding, and a no means you want to stick with the full ask. Everybody clear? Because it's not written down. Okay. Mr. McBride. No. Elise. No. Yes. Rick. Uh, yes. Oh, Fox. Denise. Yes. Stephanie. Yes. Patrick. Uh, I'm going to say full funding. I'm sorry. No. Uh, yeah. To, no. Yep. Yeah, that, that made a lot of sense. Yes. No. Yes. No. No. You're no. Fired. Okay. No. Sorry. Uh, Kate is not here. Greg. Uh, no. Um. Loretta, is that or all I have is last name Mathai. Odell. No, I apologize. I have horrible on names. Brad is not here. RJ. And Olson. Okay, so it, uh, Olson is also no. So there are two yeses, the rest are noes. We will proceed with voting on the full amount. Okay, do you, uh, you had an announcement to make? And then somebody remind me that I need a motion to do digital voting. Okay. But okay. But quick, this. quick announcement. Uh, in fairness to, there was some confusion with NDC's, um, their marketing for small businesses and the nimble marketing. 
just so you can get a clearer picture, NDC's marketing uh, is more of a providing a platform so that businesses can jump on the platform and be more uh, illuminated. And it involves an app. Um, the nimble marketing is they work directly one-on-one -on -one with the organization and they make their material and website. So just for clarification on that, because I saw some heads shaking on that. Right. Um, besides that, uh, anyone who had the page open for the voting, please refresh it because there's been some adjustments to the um, totals since we've started this meeting. So if you had it open at the beginning or midway, please refresh it right now so that we can vote with the correct amount. And Mike, do you need? Yes. Yeah. I move that we vote digitally. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay. Open your device and vote to your heart's content. Well, is it eight? We vote on eight. Eight. More or less. It's a good concept. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> what was that going to say? At least next time we will know people to ask Max Min. And then we will know. What? what? That, you're right. I know. You learn it just in time never to use it again. Thank you. <laughs> Has everyone voted? Is anyone still thinking? Yes? Done? Done, done? Greg and Patrick done? Did he restart? Because he went home. Yeah, I'm, I've completed it. Okay. This is Elise. I completed it.
Oh, also. good girl. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize you were on. Okay. Yeah, excellent. All right, and they're they're summarizing it all as we speak, and they will show us where we are. No pressure, as usual, Jamie. Yeah, right. We need you. Okay. Now we have a number. So these two projects will have to do a reboot. Okay, they can tell us where they are. Yes. So before we get on to the next, let's see what passed. Okay. Yes. So is this one or is that one? Right. Let me get that because I have all my notes in one place. Okay. So budget number three for fifteen thousand. The number two for 250. That is the cultural center. Cultural center. Number five. That's a family place expansion. Numbers mm -hmm. instead of letters. Okay. Project one, which was the um, NDC. Wait, where did you get that? Wait, you missed the 350 project call. Project 12. Yeah. Project 12, which is the Harvest House. Harvest House. And then Project 8. Is social good. Social good. And then the next three, project one is the NDC um, uh, chamber slash, yes, who's the other one? Oh, Taste Newberg. Taste Newberg. Um, climbing zone, project four. Then letters on here. Oh, project four is the yeah, the city of Newberg. EV, that's actually the ah, the city of Newburgh, EV, and project nine is the bulletproof class. Bulletproof right? class. Okay. okay. Yep. So which ones do we have to do one after? Let's let's say them out loud, Joan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, so sorry. project three is the sculpture landing pads. That's great. Yeah. Right, we just did that. Okay. We were just, we didn't do it on the mic. No, no microphone. Yep. Got it. Okay, yep. so, pro so project three is the sculpture landing pads. Then project number two is the Shehalem Culture Center. Project number five is the Lutheran Community Services, a family place expansion. Project number 10 is City of Newburgh Water Rights Purchase. Project number 12 is Newburgh Harvest House. Project number eight is Social Goods Street Seating Project. <laughs> yes. And that's why it's like the Eurovision Song Contest sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then amongst the next three projects, we will have to do a new ballot to choose one of those three projects. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So two, Sorry. Two three. Liberal Arts Guy. So amongst the three tied, we will get to select two of them. No worries. The three are project one, which is 
the small business marketing assistance project for the EV charging stations. And I need my glasses. Project nine, <laughs> the bullet resistant window project. So at this time, Ezekiel is designing a new ballot containing the three projects of which you may vote for two of them. They won't tie again. <laughs> and at that point, we will rediscuss partial funding. <laughs> No, no, no. So Shannon, a smarter person than me, has already de derived that we may well have exceeded the remaining funds to some extent since some of the higher dollar amount ones passed, or we may not have much left, but we will know that before we leave tonight. Right. So the, the original amounts did not exceed what we had left, but they were up. So we'll see. Well, there's, there. There won't be much, but we shall see where we land. Yeah, I think when we did rough calculations, it was around 700,000 if all of the high projects passed. Okay. That's what I but we'll get an exact number. Yeah. I looked at it before we left. Yeah, he'll let us know when it's ready. There will be a request. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, who are you people? So much fear. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. You never, never want to look at the total hours worked. It's a bad idea. Yeah, exactly. Shannon Buckmaster, economic health manager, also a liberal arts major. So double check my math. <laughs> <laughs> but projects one through six which have been approved by the first vote, total $1,014,981 remaining. Leave that much money remaining. I did the math separate. So I started with how much money we had at the beginning of the night, and I subtracted all of the totally approved projects. So we should be able to vote on two of the three remaining projects. Based on the ties, both of those projects should be fully funded tonight, and then we will still have a balance to consider for March 30th. I'll put these numbers on the board. The voting has been adjusted, so when everyone's ready to refresh their page and go ahead and vote a second time, we're good for that. So projects, projects one through six total 2,549,000, no, 
$2,549,500, which leaves a balance of $1,014,981. I know, I do know. All of these are good, really. I need some fencing too. <laughs> Good on you. Good Take a look at the results. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So the bullet resistant glass passed and we need to do another ballot. Or <laughs> I think we, we all should have just did you get a note for that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're going to do one more ballot for the remaining two projects and you will vote for just one. And this is the worst possible scenario that we could think of, and it's happening. Yeah. I'm going to be pretty close to that. Yeah. I don't know. No. I know a lot of them were still trying to figure out how to give it out. So it's hard. There's not there's no good way. No, I mean the only good thing would be if you had more money than asked. I know. Oh, yeah. I just couldn't I'll with the other stuff. Money events themselves. <laughs> Thank you. We're ready. Gentlemen, start your engine. <laughs> I just keep pinging the picture.
<laughs> Guys, while he's doing that, um, folks, sorry, folks, um, while he's doing that, it would be great if we could set a uh, agree a date for cutting off new applications. We're going to have less than a million dollars. We already have 18 uh, that total over $3 million of requests. Can we turn the faucet off as of Friday, for example? Would you be, if someone would make a motion, we could vote on it. And, yeah, or whatever, pick a date. End of the month. Okay. So, okay. So, month end. And that was. Rick and Mike. Um, okay. So currently for applications that we have 18 applications that have been submitted for an agenda on March 30th, total $2,511,982. Or no more than $940,000. Right. It's just a matter of, of anybody else who goes through the trouble and sends them in and city goes through and looks at them that very diminishing returns for that amount of time. I'm fine setting the date whenever we need to set it. So we have a end of the month, which is a week from now, five days. Um, all those in favor? Oh, I should ask any more discussion. Sorry, sorry, I process. Yes, Stephanie. I need to give hope to people that I, I just feel like there's not enough money to go around. And if we already have more than we can do, I, I feel like we should just stop taking. So yeah, Mike, grab a mic, grab a mic, Mike, grab a mic. <laughs> Rick, grab Mike. No, wait, no. So I, I understand what Stephanie is saying and I, to a certain degree, agree with that. But there could be some other projects that somebody could get in that might really be interesting that are, you know, very well pique our interest to, yeah, I'd like to fund that, you know? So I still would like to have it go to the 28th. Just a procedural question too that, so say someone who wasn't funded this round wants to come in for a lesser amount for the final time. I think they should be allowed to do it. Yeah, they're on the list already. That's why my number was, yeah, that's why my number was higher than the number you, it's, no, the process says that anyone who did not get selected can come in for the final round. That's why we've got a lot. I'm sorry. No, no, the people who already submitted and didn't get selected. So they, okay, we'll talk later. No, uh, later. It's, it's okay. We just need to be clear on what we're, what we're saying and what we're doing. So we can vote now. So do you want to amend their emotion? That's always fun when you do that to people. No, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, all those in favor of a cutoff date, end of the month, February 28th, five days from now, say aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. You have a date. The information will be communicated by Shannon, but also we've already been telling projects that came in in the last one, starting from about the 14th project, we've been telling them that it's unlikely that they may, they may be funded or not, depending upon the money that's left. So this will not come as a shock to people in the next pool near the bottom of the list. Okay. So I'm just gonna check, Elise, if you're still online, you need to vote, but we think you're probably taking- I did care. vote, I voted again. Keep, uh, Between the two projects, I voted. The two projects? He, he doesn't have it. What? 
Okay, I'll do it right now again. Hold on. Okay, try it again. Every voice should be heard. Do you see it now? Okay, we're good now. Thank you. Thanks. I, I, I'm resigning if we are. That's easy. You can't quit. Don't put okay. crazy ideas in my head. <laughs> Project one. Okay. All right. Marketing, downtown marketing. Okay. Yes, so uh, the winning project was project one, which was the uh, small business marketing assistance from Pace Newberg, Shahalem Valley Chamber and NDC. Okay, so that gets us through this and our total is coming right at us. Thirty-six, two fifty-two. Okay, so our total distributed tonight is uh, 260, 2,654,652. That's seven projects. She's gonna write up for eight. Oh, that's it. That's all it is. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Stephanie. That's all right, we can sort it out, it doesn't matter. Um, this is more of a council thing. Will, I would be interested in hearing at council because it fits into the sustainability goal about those electric charging stations. Right, yeah, yeah. I would like to charge my car while I go downtown. It's also, you would also like to use it. Yeah. And as I mentioned, I mentioned it. And I may have entered data wrong, but I was with her right up to the last one. When I put in the last one, you go on, you go on, and it tells you out there. I'm just to leave that. I would like to offer that if any of you have questions about the EVs, um, give me a call because I recently purchased one. And so I am learning. And uh, if any of you have questions about it, give me a call because I, I too would like to see those downtown, not because I would ever use it. Um, because I have a, a charger at home, but um, you know, I do think it would be uh, beneficial. And if you got on the council, Pat, you would get to vote on that. <laughs> Boy, you know, I, I think I'll just keep charging at home then. <laughs> okay, let me. Not if you have your own charger. <laughs> Okay, so before everyone runs out the door, our next meeting, we will have the 18 on the list. We have said that anyone who made it in but did not make it through the eight out of 12 vote is also going to be on that list, but you won't need to have them presented again. So next meeting is going to go later because instead of 12 projects, so- if they decide to try, yeah, they're not required to, but if they, once they know the amount. So at the start of that meeting, now that we know how much we have left and you'll be able to see all the projects, then we will be able to look at it and say, 
if there's a project for a million dollars and we have 900 something, whatever it is, um, we can't fully fund them, right? So we're going to have to decide what we're going to do in that case. Um, and, and really should decide it tonight so that we can tell people not to apply if their amount is over that amount. We really need to have this. I'm sorry, because I, I don't like to go late, but we're, I don't really want to start with someone coming in and presenting and telling them, well, it's nice, but we don't have enough money for you. I don't know how to, they can rewrite it and come in under. Any above 900? No. no. Yeah, which is okay. I mean, we have the rest of it to give away. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question, please? This is Shannon Buckmaster, Economic Health Manager. So we are accepting the agenda of 18 existing applications and any unfunded projects that were submitted in December and tonight at the February meeting, if they want to resubmit, plus any additional applications that come in before the 28th. In the next five days. With no cap. With no cap on the number. The cap was the date. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know. It's, I'm, I'm thinking, guys, this is a little crazy, but. Well, did I, did I hear this right that the. The ones that were not funded in December are going to automatically be on the list? No, no. they need okay, to resubmit. Right. If so they have interested. to resubmit they have to... at whatever level they want. Exactly. Got yes. it. Thank you. Correct. So, yes. Right. Right. Are we good? All right. Thank you so much for hanging in there and walking this path. Good night. This meeting is adjourned. Oh, no. Nope. Oh, Elise, yes. Oh, it's okay. I was just wondering if it's possible if we could send out, a, you may have already said this, send out an email to those that are supposed to present on the 30th and, and just tell them how much we have left to ask them to amend their application if they would like to. Yeah, um, Shannon has been communicating with them, so we can have her send an email to them and Thank if you. they need to amend it. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. I know, but it's after nine. Thank you, guys. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>